Hello there, and welcome to this third installment in the Why Constructivism series of lectures. My name is Dr. Vladimir Miletic. Um, I'm a, a psychotherapist and a life coach, and someone who cares deeply about constructivist psychology, which is why I've created this series of lectures. Uh, personal construct psychology is a way of thinking that deeply influences my professional work, and it also informs how I live my life to a really great extent. So uh, it's a theory that is rather technical and sometimes very difficult to understand, and because of this, neglected and not well known. So I've created these lectures in order to try and simplify it, uh, but not to the point where I make it sound dumb. So whether I will succeed or not, that remains to be seen. But here we are in the in the third lecture in the series. And today we will talk about what a person is or what this kind of basic sketch of, of a personality theory is in constructivism. This is not the lecture where we'll, we will finish this conversation. We're going to have several more lectures that will expand on the ideas that I will tell you about today. And uh, it's only, let's say, in, in the next, in the course of the next two or three lectures that you will have a fully formed idea of, of how we imagine the human psyche. I'm, I'm trying really hard not to put too much material into one lecture because I don't want to make them too long and I don't want to make them too complicated. The point is not to give you a headache. Uh, today, we're going to kind of talk about how we see the person in broad strokes and expand a little bit about what we talked about constructs in the previous lecture. Next week, we're going to talk about choices and agency and how we make our choices. Uh, and then in the lecture after that, we're going to talk about the body and the mind and the conscious and the unconscious and how we conceptualize this in constructivism. And then in the lecture after, I think we will be talking about emotions. And then it's through this, this combination of, of, um, of lectures that you will have a fuller idea of what a person is. Uh, also, if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the comment section below. And if not, just wait patiently. I might answer them in subsequent lectures. So let's go. Otherwise, I, will, uh, I cannot spend 10 minutes on every slide. So as you can see, we're going to cover quite a few topics. I will not go in depth with any of these because each of these could be a lecture. And in fact, when you're in training to become a constructivist therapist, most of these are separate lectures or even several lectures. So we'll talk about the fundamental metaphor, which is this kind of basic image, this basic idea that we adopt and then build our theory of personality on. We'll talk about the fundamental postulate, which is just a more technical way to talk about this fundamental metaphor. You'll see what it is. I want to keep you in suspense. Uh, we'll talk about symbolization and systems of constructs. We'll talk about monolithic systems and fragmented systems. Uh, we'll see where the person is hiding in all of these weird terms. And then in the end, we will talk a little bit about experience and change. And I'm really hoping that by the end of this, you will kind of have this general image in mind of, of how constructivists see the person, even though I'm sure that you will have a lot of questions unanswered, because as I said, I have split this into several lectures. So let's start with this. The basic idea of what a person is, according to George Kelly, is that every person is a kind of a scientist. So that is his fundamental metaphor. He published his book, in 1955, this was the age of enormous trust in science, uh, and also even kind of this, I, I don't want to say fear, but let's say a realization of what science can actually do. Remember, this is post, uh, um, kind of this is in the midst of, of the Cold War after the, the first atomic bomb was dropped. So science had a bit of an impact. So it was a powerful, impactful metaphor, and I believe that it still is to an extent, except that today science is kind of far more controversial and questioned. So I, um, I imagine that it might not resonate today as it did 70 years ago. 
Uh, essentially, what Kelly is telling us is that our everyday psychological activity is analogous in some way to scientific activity. How, you might ask? Well, we do in everyday life what scientists do. And what do scientists do? Scientists formulate and test hypotheses, right? In strictly controlled conditions, which we humans cannot always guarantee that we will have. Because um, if we are scientists, then our version of the lab is our social environment. So there are many variables that we cannot control or even predict. But fundamentally, Kelly says, every choice that we make, every word that we utter, um, every action that we undertake is us testing something, trying something out. Don't take this to mean that we're constantly testing other people. I'm not talking about this sort of covert psychological behavior trying to figure something out. I'm talking about having a worldview and then putting it to the test to see if it works. Because if you remember last time in the lecture about constructs, I was insisting that even though theoretically we can uh, construe reality in infinitely many ways, uh, this reality will always give us a reality check, so to speak. And that happens when we test our hypotheses. So I can imagine myself, I can create this self-image, a set of assumptions about myself, and they can be anything you want. I can really let my imagination run wild. But ultimately, when I start behaving according to these self-constructions, my social environment or the world that I live in is going to tell me whether my constructions are sustainable or not, whether they actually work. Of course, whether a construct is uh, validated or invalidated is kind of subjective because we're the ones who create the hypothesis. So we decide what confirms it and what invalidates it. But we do have to kind of test it. Let me give you an example. By creating this series of lectures, what I am testing is this assumption that constructivism is a theory that might appeal to people because it truly deeply appeals to me. Uh, if someone uh, responds to it positively, my hypothesis will be validated. If someone doesn't, it'll be invalidated. Will I think immediately that constructivism is not appealing to people? Not necessarily, because this is a really important assumption for me, I might question another hypothesis first, which is maybe my initial hypothesis wasn't validated because I didn't construct my experiment well. Maybe my idea that I am actually conveying these ideas simply is not a good idea. Maybe I'm not doing it as, as relatably as I should, right? So I might change my method. But I have to kind of work with what reality gives me back. I perform an experiment, I get some kind of a feedback, and then I will either keep my hypothesis and continue to believe it's true or I'll have to reject it. Right? In that sense, our psyche is really very scientific. So all forms of behavior is scientific or all forms of behavior are scientific. My grammar is not exactly on point today, is it? Um, so basically what this means is that we are always testing something. Your gestures are testing some kind of a hypothesis. Um, the choice of words that you use. Uh, I use the word relatable, for example, and I want to, I'm testing something with this, right? Someone might respond and say, well, this is interesting, but it's not relatable. So everything that we do, verbally, non-verbally, is, is all a hypothesis. We will come back to this point in a few lectures when we start talking about um, the conscious and the unconscious mind and how we conceptualize this in constructivism. But basically, let's just say for now that consciously, unconsciously, we're always testing something. Um, so that's the fundamental metaphor, that all forms of human psychological activity and all forms of human behavior are hypotheses that we are testing. We are all scientists, amateur scientists, if you will. The only difference is, is that we don't have a lab with strictly controlled conditions. We have our social environment, which is um, 
which can be a little bit unpredictable, which just means that we as scientists deal with a very complicated discipline, right? Uh, so when we put this in, in more technical constructivist terms, we get what Kelly calls the fundamental postulate. And the fundamental postulate goes like this. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the ways in which he anticipates events. I'm sorry about the gendered language, but whenever I quote Kelly, uh, he will refer to a man and a he. Uh, it's just, I think, the spirit of the times, and I don't feel good censoring his quotes. So just assume that he's saying person, because that is what he means to say. So basically what he tells us is that our psychological processes are directed by the way in which we anticipate events, which is exactly what scientists do. They create theories so that they can anticipate and control events, right? So that's just a fancy technical way of saying uh, we are scientists who test hypotheses and then we use them to predict events. These hypotheses are used to uh, guide our behavior and then together they comprise how we see ourselves and who we are. Constructs are essentially anticipations and our scientific activity is, of course, testing our constructs. Individuality corollary. So I have to um, make a slight digression here. Uh, last time when I was telling you a little bit about Kelly's life, I told you that his initial training was in mathematics, that he was a mathematician and that he became a psychologist only later on. So when he was structuring his own psychological theory, he structured it by having a fundamental postulate and a series of corollaries. In a way, it's very similar to Euclidean geometry and how you have all these postulates and then you build an entire geometry based on this. That's exactly what Kelly did. He created a series of assumptions, which, as he says in his book, he considers to be self-evident, or he says we, meaning him and his students, uh, that I also consider self-evident because I count myself among his interact students. Um, so that's why we use these kind of weird words. But it gives you a very, if you are someone who likes structure and big systems, his theories might be appealing to you because of this. So the individuality corollary says that essentially every person has a different way of anticipating events. Because uh, we anticipate, if you remember uh, our last lecture, when we talk about how we create constructs, we create constructs by observing different themes that repeat themselves and different like, life circumstances, different cultures, different ways of acting will produce different themes and therefore we will observe different themes and then we'll have different constructs. So every person has their own constructs, which is why we talk about personal science. So insofar as we can talk about what is a person in constructivist psychology, we can talk about um, how we formalize the way in which every person makes sense of their experiences. But uh, constructivist psychology has this wonderful individualistic bent, which I really, really like, meaning that we don't tend to generalize about people. We can say all people are X, but if you're truly a constructivist, you will know that this is just your hypothesis. It's not exactly what people are in and of themselves. It's just a convenient way for you in this moment to put them in that particular basket, right? But when we try to understand a person in therapy, we do this, right? We, we try to see how each person anticipates events differently, or rather, what are the specific constructs that a person uses? Because sometimes, even when we use the same um, when we use the same labels for constructs, we mean something entirely different. Take good versus evil. It's like a banal thing. But depending on your ethics or your religion or lack of religion, you might frame what's good and what, what is evil in very, very different terms. If you come from different cultures, you will also frame what is good and what is evil in different terms. In fact, if you come from a similar culture, from the if you come, this the sentence made what no sense whatsoever. What I wanted to say is that even if you look within one culture and then look at in at different 
points in time, um, you will see that what is good and what is evil has changed. We just use the same word as if it's the same thing, but we don't really mean the same now as we as we did in, I don't know, just making numbers up now, 1946 or 1845, or I don't know, at the times of the Roman Emperor Trajan, right? So uh, because cultures also evolve the same way that people evolve. Remember from the first lecture, the very basic assumption about the constructivist worldview is that nothing ever stands still. So this is why we can't really generalize about people. We have to look at one individual person. Even when you have two people who come to therapy and they say, well, we both, I struggle with anxiety. And then another client comes and says, I struggle with anxiety too. I will not think of them as the same anxiety. I will, because they are, they are, these words mean something else for these two different persons, because they come from two psychological, let's say, ecosystems, from two different systems of science, if you will. So, when we create, as we go about our lives and we test all these hypotheses, we can't really live in a mess where all our constructs just float around in this weird space, right? So these constructs are kind of arranged and connected in a way because we have a sense of self that immediately tells you, it's, it's, a, it's a, I would say, a commonsensical assumption that if, if we have all these different constructs and... Um, I think of myself as one person, not 20 different people, then they have to be connected in some way. And Kelly indeed postulates this, and he says that they are connected in a system of constructs. Right? So we, have, we always have to have several, many constructs, in fact, and they have to be connected into a system. He has, he's, he has this term called accumulative fragmental, fragmentalism. I don't even know how the hell you say that. And this term really means that it's the opposite of having a system. He says that if we have to go about our lives and create a different construct for each experience that we have, then the world and our sense of self will be hopelessly fragmented. And instead, we need a more holistic view of the world so that we can live without constant anxiety. Imagine if you had to look at each new experience as being completely new and unconnected to anything else. You would always be terribly anxious because you because you'd have no idea what to do. Instead, we'll link up our constructs, we connect them, and then we use them to predict in and in a sense generalize in a limited way. Uh, so what we construe are called elements. Right? So Every element that we have can be construed by several constructs. We call this the propositional use of constructs. Right? You can take something as banal as a book. You can take a book and think of it as something to be read. Uh, you can uh, take a book and think of it as a source of anger if you have issues with the content of the book. You can take a book and think it's the source of wisdom. You can take a book and think it's a word of God. You can take a book and adjust your table if it's wobbly. So there are many, a book is an element, and you can use it in many different constructs, which then leads to different actions in the world. This is, uh, this is in a way, uh, I like to call this psychological economy, because our psyche in constructivist world, at least, is very, um, how shall I put it? It tries to be very efficient. So you're, you're going to want a limited number of constructs that are going to explain as many things as possible. And this way of using uh, several constructs on one element allows you to act in different contexts in different ways. So it's, a, it's an economical thing. At the same time, I said that, that a book is an element, but a construct is also an element of another construct. And I know that this is terribly, terribly confusing. So I'm going to um, I'm going to explain this. And this weird series of circles is your explanation. <laughs> so, what do I mean by this? Uh, so, for, for you can't see me because um, well, I don't show myself. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. But you can't see me. That's a fact. Um, but 
if you can see me in some other videos, um, you probably know that I am a white guy. And to some people, I am a European white guy. So uh, let's, let's say that this innermost circle here is me as the element. So this is me, the person, right? Saying uh, he's a white guy could be these two other circles. One circle could represent a guy, meaning a man, like a construct, gender. And then another one could be a, um, a thing that will denote, let's say, uh, race, or even maybe we can say European man. So this could be uh, something that denotes my, my, my cultural heritage, right? So uh, when you say me, you could mean European, you could mean a guy, you could mean white, you could mean... I'm using these socially uh, construed categories just to make it easier. But we do this in our private psychological world as well. Only we use our private psychological categories, right? Um, or for example, when people say European, that's a very broad construct. So that could be this biggest circle here. And then you have to classify me as, I don't know, like Western, Eastern, Central European. And then you can say I'm from the Balkans. But if you're from the Balkans, you know that um, that Balkans is actually not one thing. So this construct is going to have a bunch of elements. We're going to have some weird ass relationships among them. And then you can go even deeper. And then if you locate me in one country, then you're, you're going to have to probably break me down to regions and so on. The same goes for Italy, which is a country where I live, uh, where if you say Italian, you were kind of going to need to uh, class it, to classify this in in at least another construct, which is from the north or from the south. Or um, then you might want to break down the south. Um, is it from Sicily or is it from Calabria? Or and then even if it's Sicily, it's really important what province you're from or even what town you're from. So you can and when you say me, I can be an element in all these constructs. Right, the element, the construct Italian, for example, like South versus North Italian, belongs to the construct of Italy. The construct of Italy belongs to the construct of Europe. So, as you can see, I, as an element, me, Vladimir, can symbolize any of these constructs or all of them at once. And each of these designations for me are elements in another construct. Gosh, I hope this wasn't confusing because I have no intention of recording this again. But that, but my point was there that when we use a word, the word is actually just an element of a construct. And when when you invoke me as a person, I'm also an element of a construct, right? Okay, so let me try and summarize this mess. So constructs have elements, right? When an element shows up, a construct gets activated, and then you act in a certain way, a certain way, right? A construct can be an element of another construct. And you see this, for example, when we construe things like sexual identities. You have people who are gay or people who are bi or people who are straight, or you have people who identify as male, as female, uh, as non-binary, as whatever you want. And then this is a construct. And this is also an element in our system of constructs, which allows us to have a personal relationship to these people, right? So um, it, it's um, if you're if you're attracted to to one person or another person sexually, that probably has to do with some of these constructs, right? And these constructs have elements which include their appearance and their bodies and so on. So. One way, we'll talk about this when we talk about social roles, but one way in which we'll play roles in, in each other's lives is by construing the constructs of other people. So we kind of spin in these infinite loops. I construe you, you construe me, I construe your constructions of me, and so on and so on. So it's it's kind of, we create this very complicated web of, of interrelationships, which is why I said that our lab, our social environment is really very complex. Um, so because some constructs uh, are elements of other constructs, that immediately tells us that the overall system has to have a hierarchy. I mean this uh, when I talk about uh, public constructs, those social categories, 
But I also mean that when I say that about a person, if my sense of self is my system of constructs, if I as a person am a system of constructs, then these constructs are always hierarchically, um, always hierarchically arranged. And here's how you can visually imagine that. There are certain constructs that are more important than others. If we have a hierarchy, that kind of goes without saying, right? Core constructs are those on the top of the pyramid that you see here on the picture. It's how do I see myself? Uh, what is really important? What are my values? You know, what is it that I can be aware of? What is it that I can perceive? We'll talk about this when we talk about anxiety. And um, I think I briefly touched on this in the last lecture where I quoted von Glassersfeld, this radical constructivist who basically says that the only time that we ever directly touch reality is when we start becoming terribly anxious, meaning when we can't really make sense of something, right? When, when something just enters our awareness for the first time. So these core constructs are terribly important. When we say sense of self, that is what we mean. We mean these core constructs. Uh, those constructs that are a little lower in the hierarchy are called peripheral constructs. Uh, they're usually more concrete in content. Uh, they can be changed without questioning our self-image. So you can change a peripheral construct and have the core construct, some of the core constructs intact. And if you remember that this uh, this image here with these purple circles, this is what I meant. If you have a construct at the base of the pyramid, that construct is likely an element of a construct that is in the middle of the pyramid. And the construct in the middle of the pyramid in turn is a construct in the core of the pyramid. So when I invoke an element that is right at the bottom of the pyramid, by proxy, I'm also invoking a core construct, which is why sometimes people get terribly upset over small things and this is because small things are really never just small things uh, because they link up all the way to our core constructs. I'm not going to go into the details of why this sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't, because this would entail me introducing a whole bunch of other uh, technical terms, but just keep that in mind. Small things are never small things because within our system of constructs, that has a hierarchy, they're always linked to something at the core of the hierarchy. So essentially, uh, when someone, let's say uh, a person can say that you have no taste in fashion, and this can link up to your sense of self, if aesthetics are terribly important to you, and then you can feel really angry, you can feel very invalidated. On the other hand, uh, because nothing related to fashion, uh, it, it, I'm, you can call me many things, but a fashion icon is not one of them because nothing related to fashion is actually, or the way that I dress at least. Aesthetics are very important to me, just the way that I dress specifically is not, which I guess in a way is a fashion statement. So if you invalidate, uh, if you say the pants you're wearing are very ugly, they're horrible pants, I won't feel invalidated as a person because to me, this doesn't directly link up to my core constructs. Right, because I not only uh, is it not because fashion is not here in the top, it's also because my constructs maybe operate in a different way. But as I said, this is not something that we should get into at this kind of introductory level. So what you need to know uh, about the hierarchy of constructs, which is that the very top of the hierarchy is the core. It's your sense of self, it's who you are. That when this changes, this is emotionally very painful. It sometimes compromises the integrity of the system, right? And when the system falls apart, that is something that we call psychosis in in in, in a more using more common language. So the hierarchy disintegrates. Uh, so whenever we change our identity, that's always a very difficult process. It's always a very slow process, and it always involves reorganizing what's below the core. Whereas when we change the periphery, this is faster and easier. And then it doesn't. This doesn't entail changing our core constructs. So psychotherapy near, nearly always operates on the level of core constructs. If it's if we're talking about long-term kind of deep reconstructive psychotherapy, 
Uh, coaching, on the other hand, can operate in this middle level, on the core level, on the on this peripheral level. Although when it comes to coaching, we're kind of usually tweaking the system and improving the system, but not radically redefining the system. Whereas in psychotherapy, sometimes this is the end game as well to change our sense of self. Right. Okay, so not every system is is fragmented like I just showed. Most systems of constructs, yours or mine, probably involve, well, for mine, I'm absolutely certain, since I don't know who's listening, then maybe yours as well. They entail a certain, um, uh, they entail a certain uh, degree of fragmentation. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. When we use the word fragmentation in clinical psychology, this really doesn't have you know, the best sound. Um, and it's not associated with something positive. In constructivism, it actually can be, and it often is. We sometimes fragment our system so that we can accommodate different patterns of behavior that necessarily aren't compatible with each other because we play different roles in our lives. And these different roles sometimes entail behaving in ways that are so different that they're not really compatible with one another. So for example, when I work with my clients, no matter what their belief system is, they can be, uh, they can make choices that I think are personally, think are strange or unacceptable to me personally. Um, they can make choices that I think are wonderful, or they can have political opinions that are really difficult for me as a person to deal with. But me as a therapist, not so much, because my role as a therapist contains a fragment of my system. And then I have other fragments as well. So when I'm at work, this professional therapist slash coach part of my system is active. And this part has a value that it doesn't judge. My job is not to tell my clients who to vote for or, or how to look at the world or what to believe in. My job is to help them uh, walk in their shoes uh, in a better way to suffer less, to change the shoes that they walk in, but not, not to change them for the shoes that I want them to walk in. So as a therapist, my system of constructs doesn't really entail any kinds of judgments about my clients. My job is to understand their constructs, see what connects to what, but not to evaluate them, not to project my personal uh, ethical standards onto their behavior, not to think the way that they think. And I achieve this because my system is fragmented. So I can have my personal beliefs. And then when I sit in my therapeutic chair and start working, I have my professional system. And it's very important for me not to mix those two up or I won't be a very good professional. You can't really help someone in the domain of mental health if you're going to project your ideas onto them, right? If you're going to moralize, especially in constructivism because constructivism is all about stepping into someone else's shoes. So when my system is fragmented, this allows me to keep these two patterns of behavior very separate. I have clients who talk about politics all the time and get upset over it. And I, my job is to understand them and see what they need and help them make sense of what they're feeling. On the other hand, in my private life, if it's a friend of mine and uh, I agree or disagree, I might tell him to shut up or that it's stupid or something or the other, right? Whereas as a professional, in the moment, because of this fragmentation, this never really enters my mind. I can genuinely say that in all these years that I've been working, it never occurred to tell my, it never occurred me to me to judge my my uh, my clients the way I would casually maybe express judgment of my friends' opinions, thanks to fragmentation. And most people have this as well. Like you don't need to be a therapist. You can be um, if you work as a waiter, for example then you probably have one system of constructs when you're serving your customers. And then uh, and then you apply a whole other fragment of your system when at home your spouse tells you, oh, can you go and, and grab me, uh, I don't know, bring me a, a drink. Because uh, to your customer, you have to smile and say right away. To your spouse, you can say, go and get it yourself. So different things are acceptable in different contexts. And because we have to accommodate all this within our sense of self, then we fragment our systems. 
what's important is that you see how this pyramid on the left and this pyramid on the right have this top that's a little wider than the rest. I didn't choose these images randomly. Uh, this part is this very, very core part of the system is usually unified. So all the fragments are unified in the core of the system, which means that at the end of the day, no matter what roles we play and how different they may be, we still have this one sense of self. We know that we are one person at the end of the day. Monolithic systems, on the other hand, have this problem that they're not very flexible. Uh, for example, I remember when I was, uh, I, I quite like psychoanalysis. That's my, let's say, second favorite psychological theory after constructivism. And I remember when I was reading uh, about um, how they consider integration to be really important. Um, and I always used to think, well, I don't know. I don't think it's, it's maybe back in the day, uh, in, in Freud's world, you could have a monolithic system and be a functional person. But if you have to be a someone's partner, a parent, a friend, uh, uh, if you have to have a professional identity or several of them, uh, in this day and age, your system is probably not going to be very functional if it's monolithic. If you're a monk somewhere living in a monastery, then yes, I'm sure you can have a monolithic system of constructs. But if you're a modern person living in the contemporary world, your system will be uh, reasonably fragmented. Let's put it that way. Uh, is this all there is to us, this system of constructs? Well, I guess yes and no. The answer depends on how many hours you have. Um, First of all, even when we talk about a system of constructs, when we present it as a pyramid, this is a snapshot. Constructs undergo what we call the experience cycle uh, because every time we use a construct, it's tested. We don't replace, especially if they're core constructs, we don't replace them right away if they get invalidated once. But it changes how we, um, how we use this construct. It might become more permeable, except more elements, or it become, maybe it becomes impermeable, except fewer elements, right? So our constructs always change a little bit. And then over the years, we may stop and realize that even though we're using the same word, we actually mean something completely different, right? So constructs get revised. When they accept new elements, elements kind of reshuffle within a construct. So this is a very dynamic structure. We can't say that when we map out the system once, that this is all there is to us, because the system changes. Our sense of self always evolves. And as our constructs change, our world also changes. Because remember, we never see the world directly. We see the world through the through certain glasses, through filters, and constructs are these filters. So it's not just that our constructs change, that our sense of self changes, but when this changes, the world for us also changes. And if you're going to ask me, are we more than our constructs? That is a very complicated question. Uh, Kelly addresses this in the very beginning of his book. And he says that what differentiates living things from things that are not living is that living things, including humans, can construe other things around them. So is, is uh, this is, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know how to phrase this without creating. So I'll, I'm going to make a note for myself and create a lecture out of this uh, at some point later on. Uh, but we can both say that we are our system of constructs and that there's always something more that we can never really truly know. Because the system is always changing, because the system is not entirely verbal, uh, we can't really ever fully verbalize our system of constructs. At the very least, you can say that no matter how well you know yourself, you can never know yourself entirely. In a way, uh, if I didn't say this before, then... I'm saying it now, but in a way, entire constructivist psychology can be called the wisdom of not knowing, right? Here is a um, series of, of sculptures uh, that I think really nicely depict how constructivism sees the self. 
uh, and this series of structure, the structures, sorry, the series of sculptures are called um, the self. They're self-portraits by an artist called Mark Quinn. I know they're kind of gruesome looking, um, and this is because they are. Uh, they are made out of his own blood. Uh, so this first one on the left is, I believe, from 1991, and this one on the right is from 2011. And there's there is a newer one, or even two newer ones. I just didn't have a, any place to space to put them on the screen. So this is the artist's way. Uh, you can go on his website, markwin.com, and there's a whole story behind this. It's related to him uh, kind of dealing with his addiction and alcoholism. And uh, these sculptures, these self-portraits are kind of milestones that mark how he changes over time. And what I like about this uh, and why I think it illustrates constructivist thinking very well, because this is frozen blood. So first of all, for these uh, to remain stable, you have to have certain conditions. So they have to be in a museum and they have to be frozen. If the power goes out, they will melt, right? As years go by, it's the same blood, but it gets, it changes a little bit. It has a different shape. Look at the first one, look at the last one. So over the years, he has reshaped himself, but it's still the same person. And it, this illustrates exactly how the stuff that makes us up reshapes itself depending on the circumstances in which it exists. And the fact that this would melt if the power went out in the museum is also rather important because it tells us that our sense of self, our system of constructs, our personality is not just how we see ourselves, but also how we test our hypotheses in this lab that we live in. So our constructs depend on, on validation, invalidation, events that occur to us, how we make sense of them. So we're in constant dialogue with our environment. We can't exist without other people. And I think these sculptures really beautifully um, illustrate how this stuff the humans are gets reshaped as life experiences accumulate. So it's not that he's growing as a result of this. It's not that he grew two heads over the years because he has gained more experience. It's that the very substance of who he is has taken on a different shape because of his experience. So it's not that the older we are, the more constructs we have. It's that our constructs change. This is a really, really important point. So it, the way that we change is exactly how science changes. Science doesn't change only by accumulating facts. So science is not this big repository of facts. Uh, science is, is, the, is how you make sense of the facts that you have. And then over the years, gravity has been the same, but it has been conceptualized in many different ways by different scientists. As we learn more, we kind of reshape our theories. And the theory that we have is, is the experience of all these previous scientists is kind of an abstraction of that experience. So this is this latest head that we have contains the evolution traced by all these heads before it. And this is how we see the person in, in constructivism as a system of a very complex constructs, a kind of highway, as Kelly says, of constructs that are constantly reshaping themselves, remodeling, but because the process is slow and gradual, look at the last one and the first one here. Uh, he has changed substantially, but you know, even I would say the size of his nose has changed, but it has evolved very slowly. Um, the shape of his face is roughly the same, but not quite identical. So these changes take place slowly. And even though we never stand still because of the slowness of certain changes, because of their pace, we have this impression that we are uh, we are still one person. So even when you think you're not changing, you are. You're oh, you're changing right now. Even without psychotherapy, without coaching, without workshops, meditation, whatever you have it, whatever technology of change you want to use, you will change. There's absolutely no way that you will not change. If this rings uh, some bells in your head, if you're acquainted with Buddhism, 
yes, this is very, very similar to the Buddhist concept of non-self and dependent arising. And in general, I would say that Kelly's theory shares some really important connections with Buddhism. Impermanence is, is one of those things. There's absolutely nothing permanent about the world or about our system of constructs. The fact that we think that we have a permanent self is really an illusion in personal construct psychology. Therapy and other ways of changing are simply intentional ways of changing. So you can either allow yourself to be changed by the circumstances um, that you're in and decisions that you're making, or you can be intentional about it. Kind of put your constructs into words, carefully contemplate your alternatives, and then make decisions to mold yourself to become what you want to become, or as close to that as reality will allow. So that's why therapy works so well, is because it directs change. But it doesn't create something, and maybe accelerates change as well, but it doesn't create something that doesn't that's not already happening, because change is something that is always happening. I find this very comforting, I have to say, because every time when I think, oh, geez, I have this problem and it's never going to change, I remind myself that, in fact, it will. I can either allow it to change me or I can take active measures and then change to be who I want to be. But it, my psyche will never stand still. So that's all I have for you. Hopefully it was not too complicated because I got the feeling that I was a little meandering along the way. If, you're, if there's anything that you need to take away from this, it's the metaphor of every person as a scientist. Uh, the fact that these uh, scientific hypotheses are what shapes our system of constructs and that our system of constructs never stands still. Take these three things. Next time, we will talk about choices, how choices shape who we are and how who we are shapes our choices and even what we see as choices. So it's, it's a kind of further exploration of how we see the person. So we'll talk about how a person acts and how we understand that in constructivism. Thank you very much for sticking with me. And uh, I will see you uh, next week when the next lecture goes out. Bye-bye.